standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong core, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of love. Let me more of their beauty sing, wonderful words of love. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, Wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ, the blessed one, gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to the loving calm. Wonderful words of love, all so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of love. Wonderful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of love. Unto my feet, 
and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Let's pray together. Lord, tonight as we gather as a family of faith, we recognize that in a very dark, dark world, the only light that we have is your word guiding us step by step. And God, I pray tonight that this would be another step in our journey with you, that you would guide us, that you would direct us, you would show us whether to go to the right or to the left, to go forward or to go backwards. May your word be that light into our path and that lamp into our feet. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. All right, before y'all go shake hands and hug next, just a couple of insight here. We're going to gather in a moment. We're going to sing a little bit more. And then after our offertory, we're going to have a special presentation and a video, all that be short, by our Gideon ministry that's going to speak to us about the impact of the Word of God putting in to the secular marketplace. And then we're going to go, we're going to dig into the book of Genesis, folks, and we're going to answer every question. Well, we're going to probably ask more questions than we had. So here's what I want you to do. Go shake a hand, hug a neck, and say, you know, it's not a sin to sit in the front row. Y'all go for it. join together as we continue singing I exalt thee for the whole Lord art high above all the earth thou art exalted far above all gods for the whole Lord art high above all the earth the son of thy love, Jesus who died and is now gone above, hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again, we praise thee, Spirit of life who has shown us a Savior scattered our none. Hallelujah, then the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, then the glory. again, fill its heart with thy love, may its soul be rekindled with fire from above, hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, thine the 
Let us pray. The Lord, I just uh, acknowledge, Lord, that any opportunity we have to come before you, praise your name, glorify you, Lord, is a blessing. And now that we come to give, I just pray that you will multiply these gifts and uh, just uh, uh, in a way that will um, give us every opportunity we have to uh, spread your word uh, from Opelika to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.
for letting me be here tonight. I'm Larry Humphrey, and as I look around, I know a lot of you, and y'all know me, and y'all know that I'm not a polished speaker and I'm not a professional speaker, so if I get tongue-tied, y'all just pray for me, and it always works out. But I am, I'm part of the Lee County Gideons, and uh, what we do is uh, hand out the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit use it and put it out there in the traffic lanes of this world and let Him use it where He sees fit. We do this by putting the Bibles in motels and hotels, uh, schools, um, and hand them to military people as they're being deployed, uh, doctor's offices. So there's lots of ways that we do that. Uh, last year, we put out, as you saw, about 91 copies of the Scripture worldwide. And uh, here in Lee County, we put out about 12,000. And uh, most of those went to uh, Auburn University. About 8,000 of them went over there. But we're also in the motel and hotels. There's about 40 of those here. There are about 3,000 rooms in Lee County. And we try to visit those twice a year. So, uh, so we stay busy. And uh, I'm going to let you know how you can help us. First of all, pray for us. Pray that more churches like yours will allow us to come in and tell about our ministry. Uh, also pray that more schools will allow us to come in and hand out those scriptures to fifth graders and seniors. Uh, that's one way you can help. Uh, second way, if there's a man here that would like to join us, we'd love to have you. Just uh, please see me or there's several Gideons here tonight. Uh, just um, we can tell you what hoops and all you have to, to do to, to become part of us and we'd love to have you. Third way is there's a go to Gideons.org. You can purchase cards, get well cards. Thinking of you cards, any kind of thing that you purchase there goes directly to, to buy Bibles and ship all over the world. And then the fourth way, there should be, you may have gotten an envelope or something when you came in this, uh, this afternoon. And if you feel so led today, you can put it in there tonight. Or if you want to take it home and uh, mail it in, either one is fine. But, um, but we would love for you to participate that way. And, and I'm proud to be part of an organization that every dime that we get from churches or people like you goes directly to purchase scriptures, to put them out. Any kind of overhead cost that Gideon's acquired in the year is picked up by the dues that we as Gideon's pay. So uh, I, I'm part, pl proud to be a part of that. Uh, the small little Bibles that we hand out at schools usually cost about $1.40. The larger Bibles cost about $5 that we hand, or put in motels and hotel rooms. Uh, before I, I sit down, I do want to leave you with one testimony that happened to me. I was speaking one time, and there was an older man in the back. Well, he was an old man. Um, he said, could he say something? And he did. And he told about when it was right at World War II time. He, um, he was 18 years old. He joined the Army, was shipped over here to Fort Benning, and went through training and all. And uh, a few weeks, he, uh, they finished up, and he was getting on the bus being shipped to Germany. And uh, he said there was an old silver-headed guy, and I don't think there's anything wrong with silver hair now, so I don't know why he said that. But said handed him a little Bible as he was getting on the bus, and he said, uh, you know, what is this guy's, does he not know that we have just finished at Fort Benning? and we're about as tough as you get, you know? But he, uh, he went on to Germany, and he'd been there just a few days, and he said that he had... Uh, He'd seen some things, and he'd had to do some things that he just was not prepared to do. But he, uh, he read that New Testament, and the Holy Spirit worked on his heart, and, and he gave his life to the Lord. And he said just a few weeks after that, I guess they were in a battle or mission or something, he, uh, he lost his left arm. And he, um, he says that he remembers on the way home back to the United States that he was saying, uh, you know, uh, God, here it is. I've, in the last few months, I've just given my life to you. And I, I'm serving my country, and now I've, I've lost my arm. I don't understand, you know, what is it that you want me to do? But he came on home, and he was with a cousin of his that he said they used to hunt and fish and fight with all the time. But he was telling them about this Jesus that he had given his life to, and he gave him that little Bible that he had received uh, when he left Columbus over there. And in the back of it, a lot of them have a place where you can write your name when you have made the decision to give your life. And, um, and he showed him that and told him, about it and t told him to take it and read it and just be open to what the Lord would have him do. And uh, he said it was about 55 years later, he was at that cousin's funeral, and his cousin's children came to him and said, hey, we think we found something that belongs to you. We found in Dad's stuff last night. And he took it, and it was that one little Bible that he had been given when he boarded the, the bus over there. And, um, and he looked in the back, and there was his name where he would wrote it many years ago, and his, name, his cousin name was also on there. So that just goes to show how God can take just a little bit of money and make big difference in those two guys' life. And the guy that lost his arm, he became a, uh, a Methodist minister. So I'm sure that the Lord used him in many ways in others' lives too. 
So I just encourage you, you know, there are lots of ways that we can, uh, that we can serve the Lord. It's just not the Gideons, you know. When we're saved, we're saved to have a personal relationship with him. And we're also saved to serve him. And so I just ask you now, as you go through this week, to just pray and ask the Lord where he would have you to serve him at. I appreciate y'all letting me be here. Thank you, Larry. I know um, tonight, if you don't believe, tonight is a demonstration of, of providence. He said, well, how do you know it's tonight? And by the way, uh, Brian, this is way too tall, brother. I'm sorry. We've got to go way down. There we go. That's about right. Providence is God working behind the scenes when you don't know he's working. We scheduled Larry to come here a couple months ago, I believe, that this was the time that the night that he would come out and share about the Gideons. This last week, I had the privilege of being in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, where I facilitate a doctoral seminar to pastors from all over America regarding evangelism in a contemporary context. I had pastors from Harlem, New York, from California, uh, from right around the corner in Huntsville, Alabama. I had them everywhere. There was about 25 of them. One of them actually uh, was a pastor of a small little congregation, but he did a lot of work on a community college campus in Michigan. And he shared the story with us because we were dealing with the topic that you and I live in a post-Christian America, whether we want to acknowledge that or not, we truly do. And we've gotten to the point where people who uh, believe in Jesus Christ as their savior are the extreme minority uh, in our culture. And we were talking about that we can no longer assume that everybody we meet has heard the message of Jesus. You just can't assume it anymore. And this man raised his hand in the back and he said, uh, he said, Doc, he said, let me share with you a story. Just last week, the first week of school, the Gideons had come on the campus and they were passing out those little New Testaments. And there was a graduate student that he had a conversation with who came from Saudi Arabia. And he took one of those little New Testaments and he came to my newfound friend and he said, is this the Bible that I've heard so much about? He had never seen one. He had never held one. Just for reference, his name is Sultan. If you want to pray for Sultan, I pray one day he'll have the same testimony that your friend did. And when he received that testimony, as he made his way to the military, maybe this young man uh, will have the same testimony and the same story when one day he returns to the Middle East. You know, tonight, speaking of the Word of God, I want us to go back into the book of Genesis. And hopefully this week you have begun the journey as we walk through Scripture chapter by chapter, day by day. And we're just going to talk about some of the questions that the book of Genesis not only forces us to ask, but oftentimes does not quite answer. Let me give some qualifications tonight. There is no way in the next 30 minutes we can answer every question in regards to the book of Genesis. I have been studying this book of the Bible for many decades, and I still don't have a lot of answers to a lot of questions. Secondly, every question that I bring up tonight, we could go for an hour just on that question alone. So if there's one that I touch upon, you say, I wish we would have spent more time there, I can guarantee you we are not going to address to the full depth any and all aspects regarding that question. And so what I've done tonight is I have listed for us some of the most commonly asked issues that come up in regards to the book of Genesis. Now, the skeptic, the atheist, would say that these are contradictions in Scripture. I wouldn't call them contradictions. I would simply call them apparent discrepancies. In other words, they appear to be a contradiction. They appear to be a problem. They appear to be a difficulty. But once we reconcile them with other scriptures, then it gives us a clear picture of what God is or is not communicating. Now tonight we have sung that thy word, that God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so tonight I'm going to address these questions from other passages of scripture. Now let me give you a warning. The answers may not exactly fit into your little box of this is how I see it. But we're going to address what does the Bible say in regards to the subject matter. So we're going to begin at the very beginning of the book of Genesis, and we're just going to walk through the first several chapters and ask some serious questions and hopefully have some significant answers. The first question we actually dealt with some this morning is why is there darkness before the light? It just doesn't seem rational that you would have darkness first and then light. However, as we discussed this morning, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. 
In the first chapter of Genesis alone, you have reference to darkness four times. And at some point, you and I have to place what we call the fall of Satan sometimes before chapter three. Sometime before there, you, you have to address it. And the very fact that you have darkness present, the very fact you have death present, uh, shows me in light of 1 John 1, 5, that is why it appears to have darkness before the light. The second question is this, why is day two not called good? You may not have ever noticed that. But as you walk through the creation account, it says, and God saw that he did, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. However, in verse 8 of chapter 1, it says, and God called the firmament heaven, and the evening the morning were the second day. There is no description that day two is actually good. Now, it says that there is a firmament, there is a divide that is placed between what we know as the heavens and the earth. The book of 2 Peter chapter 3, it says, In the days of old that, heaven, that the earth was both in and out of the waters. The Bible describes that there was a time in days past where there was no division. There was a time in days past uh, where, shall we say, the geography of heaven and earth was not the distance that it is today. In fact, all throughout Scripture, it makes it very clear that you and I don't have just the ability to step into the doorframe of heaven. We must go through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Why is it not called good? Because when there is a division between the realm of heaven and the realm of earth, when there is that chasm between the creation and the creator, it is never good. Allow me to remind you though that the Lord has a solution for this. Just like in Titus chapter 3 verse 5, it says, by the Holy Spirit we are regenerated, we are born again. Matthew chapter 19 verse 28, Jesus makes this statement. He says, the day is coming where the earth will be regenerated. When you read the last couple of chapters of your Bible, it says, I saw a new heaven, I saw a new earth, I saw a new Jerusalem, and there's no mention of a firmament at all. And so the reason on day two that it is not called good is because of the fact that sin has entered the realm of creation at some aspect with the fall of Satan. That chasm is not good. The next question is this. Why are there three days before the sun shows up? That's one of those great questions that skeptics love to talk about because on day one, there is light. On day two, there is the firmament. On day three, there is the vegetation. Then on day four, all of a sudden, the greater light the sun, the lesser light the moon, and the stars also for signs and for seasons, etc., etc. And the question often is asked, how can we have evening and morning? How can we have a, a, what we would call a 24-hour cycle of a day? How can we have all this and not have that thing in the sky that we know as the son. Let me take you back to verse 2 of chapter 1. It says that the Spirit of the Lord was moving across the deep. You know, when you get to Revelation chapter 21, in what we know is the new heaven, it says that in the new heaven there is no sun, because Jesus Christ is the light thereof. When God is on the scene and when God is moving and God is forming what we know as the creative order, You don't have to have some giant ball in the sky illuminating things because he is in the midst thereof and he is there with his hands on the creation. There is no need. But on day four, it says he placed the greater light to rule the day. He placed the lesser light to rule the night. And one of my favorite statements there in verse 14, imagine this, he says, and he flung the stars also. You know, it's almost as if it was an afterthought. All those stars that you see in the night sky The Lord just says, oh, I decided to put a few of those up there as well. And so even though it disturbs some that the sun is not there for what we would know as 72 hours, because you have the presence of the Lord, because you have the spirit of the Lord, because you have the activity of the Lord, according to Revelation chapter 21 and 22, there is technically no need of a sun when you have the active presence of the Lord. The fourth question is this, and this is a unique one. It's on day five. On day five, in verse 21 specifically, it says, and God created, and some of your Bibles will say great whales and every living creature that moves. Some of your Bibles will say great sea creatures. And so why is it that all of the created order, why is it with all of the generic statements about the creation, why would God mention whales of all things? Well, the answer is very simple. In Matthew chapter 12, 
Jesus Christ is dealing with a bunch of his skeptics and those that are questioning who he is and why he's come. And they said, we know you've walked on water. By the way, I'm interjecting this. We know you've walked on water. We know you've multiplied food. We know you've healed the lame. Off of the interjection, show us a sign. Do something so supernatural that it'll be without question. You remember what Jesus said? He goes, I'm gonna show you one sign. As Jonah was in the belly of the well three days and three nights, so the Son of Man, speaking of himself, will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Do you realize that the only story and the only illustration that Jesus Christ specifically gave for his death and resurrection was the controversial story of Jonah and the famous whale. And here we are on day five of creation. In some of your versions it says, and he brought forth whales. The illustration of the vessel, the mechanism that would picture our salvation is mentioned even before our creation. By the way, as a humorous antidote, some years ago, many years ago, I was being interviewed for a, a youth pastor at a local church where I was living. And there was an elderly gentleman that was serving on that search team. And they were asking all kinds of questions, this and that. And he was the one that was designated to uh, investigate me theologically. You know, wh where did I stand when in regards to scripture? And I'll never forget, he asked me, he said, what do you think about Jonah? I said, what do you want to know about him? He said, was he really swallowed by a whale? I said, absolutely. Was he really in there three days? I said, absolutely. Was he really vomited up on the, sea, on the seashore? I said, absolutely. He said, okay, we're good. And everybody else looked at him. And then he, looked at him, he said, if he believes that as it's written, he believes it all. So that being said, there is this whale that is mentioned in verse 21 in some versions of Scripture. All right, so now once we move past those first five days, let's get to the questions that we really struggle with. Here's the next one. Were Adam and Eve the only humans in the garden? The year was 1961, and a professor at one of our Southern Baptist seminaries wrote a text entitled, The Message of Genesis. And what it was, it became, um, allow me to use a, probably a pretty pejorative term, it became a hand grenade for our theology, where he postulated what he called the myth of Genesis. Now, not the untruths of Genesis, but the story of Genesis. And his entire premise for the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis is that we cannot read them literally. Whether it be seven 24-hour days of creation, or whether it be a literal Adam and Eve, or whether it be a boat the exact dimensions of which Noah got on, or the size of the flood that took place. The book was published in 1961, and several years later, I believe somebody thought they were doing something wise. They ended up doing something that caused history to change forever. For when messengers, as I've served for many years, when they arrived at the Southern Baptist Convention that year in the middle 60s, there was a copy of this book on every single seat in the auditorium propagating the idea that the stories of Adam and Eve, the stories of creation, though they may be truth in principle, they could not be taken literally. Now, I realize that one day when we get to heaven, there's going to be a lot of folks that weren't card-carrying Southern Baptists, but allow me to brag for just a moment. Did you know that since what we know is the Protestant Reformation, the Southern Baptist Convention is the only major denomination to ever go back to its conservative roots. We're the first one ever, and you know why? Because so many people read that book, saw that book, and got frustrated with this overgeneralization and disbelief in scripture that allowed many to return to looking at the scriptures as they were written and not as we would like to see them. When we look at Adam and Eve and we look at humanity today and all the groups of people and all the shades of color, one of the natural responses is there's no way that all of us came from Adam and Eve. However, when's the last time that your kids or your grandkids look just like you? And yet we go back and say, there's no way this all happened the way that it did. Even the genetic world today will tell you that the margin of difference between human A and human B is minor 
at best. In scripture, we have one man, Adam. We have one woman, Eve. And Adam called her the mother of all the living. So whether we struggle with it or not, the Bible testifies that we're the only two human beings that were placed in the Garden of Eden. And we'll deal with the subsequent question in just a moment. Here's my favorite question in the book of Genesis. Did Adam have a belly button? You realize that's a great question, right? Adam was formed out of the dirt. Eve was formed from his rib. Cain and Abel came from them in a natural process. I don't know if he did or he did not, but can we at least testify there was no biological reason for him to have one? Now, the Lord has the ability to create him out of the dirt and give him one, but I would have loved to have been in his home when one of his teenage boys looked at him and said, why do I have an intention and you do not? But nonetheless, we don't know the exact answer to that question, but because God formed him out of the dirt, and because he was not formed in the natural fashion as each and every one of us was, there is the distinct possibility that Adam did not have a belly button. Next question. If, if the earth is so good, why a garden? Have you ever thought of that? If everything is so great and everything is so wonderful, why didn't God just say it's all yours, enjoy it all? In fact, the Lord said he placed him in the garden. Now, we mentioned earlier the fact that, that there is darkness, there is death. There was the original, as we discussed this morning, the rebellion uh, of Satan. When you go to Luke chapter 9, Jesus gives an account, a first eyewitness account of the fall of Satan, and here's what he said. He said, I saw Satan fall to the earth. In fact, later in the book of Matthew chapter 4, during the temptation of Jesus Christ in the wilderness, Satan offers him all the kingdoms of the earth. Later in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, Jesus Christ, it says when that seventh trumpet is sounded, that he receives the deed to all the kingdoms of the earth. I think one of the things that we forget when we read through the book of Genesis is that when Adam and Eve were created, when the garden was established, that sin was already present in the creation. It just wasn't present among humanity. So what we discover is the garden was a place of protection. The garden was a place of provision. And thus why they were so upset that they would be removed thereof. This leads to the next natural question. Where is that garden? Where was it? Well, the Bible says at the end of Genesis chapter 3 that there are angelic hosts with flaming swords protecting the entrance to the garden so that none of us can enter. If you read Genesis chapter 2, it mentions four rivers of which flowed in the midst of what we know as the Garden of Eden, and one of them we're very familiar with. It's known as the Euphrates. And so when we begin to look at that geographically, we most naturally go to what we know as the Middle East, to the area of Babylon, to the modern-day Kuwait, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. The birthplace, the original place of humanities inauguration and initiation. The thing that is interesting about the four rivers that are mentioned in Genesis 2 is that two of them can be easily discovered using archaeology and the other two cannot. And that has caused some to struggle because as we have the technology we have, surely we could see evidence thereof. The Bible says there's four, we can only find two. Allow me to share with you a could it be this evening. When you get to Revelation chapter 21, and it talks about the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem, we discover something very interesting about new Jerusalem. New Jerusalem is three-dimensional. This old fallen earth Jerusalem is two-dimensional. And even though we have a record of the Euphrates, even though we have a record of where that would be geographically, it leaves open the very distinct possibility that before sin entered in, what we know as the Garden of Eden may have been a three-dimensional existence. Now, for those of you that struggle with that, let me remind you, New Jerusalem will be three-dimensional, and those angelic beings with their flaming swords, if the garden was simply two-dimensional, then where are they, and why haven't we seen them? The Bible says they stand at the entrance so that no man would enter again. Next question, speaking of the Garden of Eden, did Eve actually have a conversation with a snake? 
The Bible says in Genesis 3 that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Now, allow me to share with you the theological version of the square and the rectangle. You realize by definition that a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not always a square. A snake is always a serpent, but a serpent is not always a snake. In fact, when you get to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 and 40, it says, Be not marveled that Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Did you know that every angelic being that you see in Scripture is described with a variety of characteristics? Number one, they're always described as males. Ladies, don't get upset with me. I'm sorry. Hallmark is wrong. I apologize. Number two, they're always described as powerful entities, not weakling by any stretch of the imagination. This picture that we have of short, fat, squatty guys playing the harp, that's not biblical. That's TV land. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, chapter uh, 31 through 37, there is one angelic being who kills over 100,000 men in one night with one sword. When the three angelic beings visit Abram and Sarah at their tent, they never question who they are. They appeared as men. And the book of Hebrews says that you and I have entertained angels unaware. And so the distinct possibility is that the conversation she had was not with a, quote, slithering reptile, but with the fallen one who desired their demise, transforming himself to appear as, quote, one of the good guys, and simply talked her and eventually Adam into believing that they knew better than God. What was the forbidden fruit? Here is my most profound answer of the night. You ready? I do not know. In fact, if you do a historical study of this, they'll say it was some time of pomegranate or such. I would be, if you had to pin me down and say, what do you believe it actually was? I would have to say it was some type of fruit of the vine, some type of grape entity. You say, why is that? Because when you get to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30 through 32, it talks about the blood of the grape. And yes, we have later on in scripture where Jesus talks about his body and his blood. And we talk about doing in remembrance at the Lord's Supper. We celebrate the blood that was shed, the sacrifice that was given. There is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. There's a lot of different theories on what the quote forbidden fruit might have or might not have been. And I don't know that any of us will ever come to a consensus, but can we all agree on this? We as humanity went where we should have never gone and we ended up getting what we never desired because we thought we were smarter than God. As we transition out of what we know as the Garden of Eden, the next natural question we have in Genesis chapter four is this, where did Cain get his wife? Because at this point in scripture, it says that Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. We know that Abel has been killed by Cain. Cain goes east of Eden to the land of Nod, and it says that he goes with his wife. The biblical solution, though it may make us a little uncomfortable, is found in Genesis chapter 5, where it says that Adam lived a certain amount of years, and he begat many sons and daughters. Gives new meaning to kissing your sister, does it not? Okay, I'm sorry for that. But when you look throughout the Old Testament, all of the genealogies from Genesis all the way to the New Testament, none of them contain specifically the name of a woman. But we do know, obviously, there were women that were present, and we are not given the names of, nor are we given the numbers of the daughters of which Adam and Eve have. In fact, we're only given the names of three sons, Cain, Abel, and Seth. So his wife, most likely, biblically speaking, according to chapter 5, was, yes, one of his own kinfolk. The next question is this, so who was Cain scared of? Remember he said that when he was banished east of Eden, he said, put something on me lest they find me and they kill me. People ask, who's he talking about? Are there other people? And this is what has caused many to look at the book of Genesis and say, well, Adam and Eve were just representatives of humanity. Surely they weren't just a, a single solitary pair. There's been many attempts at answering this, but allow me to remind you of what we've already addressed so far. Satan has already fallen, and according to Scripture, when he fell, he took many of the angelic beings with him. And what does 2 Corinthians 11 say? These angelic beings often appear as angels of light. 
when he said, I am fearful, I am scared, lest they kill me, I think oftentimes we forget that the environment of the creation may have been much different than we have given it credit for on our flannel boards of theology. It was a dark, death-filled creation of which God had infused his light and his life. But humanity fell into the trap of believing they were smarter than God. Next question, chapter five of the book of Genesis. Why did humanity live so long before the flood? I mean, you think about that. They're living 180 years and then having babies. I don't know about you, but that doesn't find appealing at all. But nonetheless, you know, they're living 969 years, 777 years, 800 and some odd years. Then you get to Genesis chapter 10, and I know that's not technically on our reading plan yet, and all of a sudden we see those years decrease rapidly. I think there's many explanations, but primarily it deals with the flood that is in the middle. When Noah's flood took place, and as you read over the next couple of days, the details therein, the Bible says that the heavens opened up and, and the waters below came forth. And what we see in Genesis chapter six through nine is something dramatic took place midst the creation. That which lived 900 years before the flood is now living 90 years. That which has an incredible lifespan pre-flood all of a sudden is limited to seven to 10 and decades. Why did humanity live so long before the flood? What the best we can conjecture is that somehow, some way, what we know as our atmosphere and our environment had to be somehow different before the heavens opened up and the floods came forth. Because on the other side, we see a much different picture than on the front side. Next question is this, why did Enoch not die? The Bible says there in Genesis chapter five that Enoch walked with the Lord and he was not for God took him. He's only one of two people in the book of Genesis that it says that they walked with God. It was Enoch and Noah who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He did not die simply put because he walked with God. And then the Bible says the Lord took him. Now, some of you may say, well, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, that all men must die and face the judgment. Why did not Enoch fit into that equation? Well, let me remind you that Elijah does not fit into that equation in the Old Testament as well. And so allow me to quote my very much wise wife when she says this, that there are exceptions to the rule, but the exceptions do not make the rule. Generally speaking, 99.99% of the time humanity dies a natural death as a product of sin. Enoch did not die because the Bible says he walked with the Lord and he was not. You do realize that that's a picture of the one day coming rapture. The Bible says that there will be a time where those who are alive in Christ will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord. Those bodies which were mortal will put on immortality and that which was limited will be eternal. There is coming a day where an entire group of people will be walking with the Lord and will be not because the Lord will take them. Enoch is simply, again, a foreshadowing of that great event in the New Testament. Next question is, who are the sons of God? This is Genesis chapter 6. We could go for hours on this and not solve it. But in Genesis chapter 6, it says, the sons of God and the daughters of men, they had babies together and everything went awry. Who were they and what was happening? You've only got two real options. Option A is the sons of God were the descendants of Seth. The daughters of men were the descendants of Cain. And those of the godly line were getting together with those of an ungodly line and making God so upset, he decided I cannot handle this anymore. However, when it comes to what the Bible says in the Old Testament referring to sons of God and quote the traditional rabbinic interpretation, the book of Job chapters 1, 2, and 37 describe the angelic beings that celebrated the creation as the sons of God. And I know that oftentimes people say there is no way that the quote fallen angelic hosts were having some type of relationship with the daughters of men. That, that just doesn't happen. Well, do you find it interesting that that's the storyline of almost every movie coming out of Hollywood nowadays? The supernatural mingling with the natural. That's the story of all Greek and Roman mythology. That the quote gods and the humans came together to create that which was of a supernatural hybridness. 
interesting, the description in Genesis chapter 6 of their children is they were mighty men of old, men of renown. In other words, they were not dying. Let me give you a warning. When you get to Matthew chapter 24, what does Jesus say about the last days? It will be as the days of Noah. And are we not, even as a world today, desirous of somehow mingling the supernatural and the natural? Whether it be simply the descendants of Seth, the descendants of Cain, or whether it be a supernatural interpretation, we can all agree that they were going where they had no business going, and they ended up receiving the judgment thereof. The next question is, then, who are the giants in verse 4? Some of your Bibles will read the Nephilim, those men of renown, these giant creatures who later show up in the book of Numbers chapter 13. There's a distinct difference here. In Numbers chapter 13, uh, these are human descendants of a specific group of people. Here in Genesis chapter 6, we notice that these are creatures, these are offspring that are pictured as not only having great strength and size, but the ability to live an incredible amount of time beyond that which the Lord has commissioned. In fact, the Lord said that it was wickedness in all of the earth. The giants of Genesis 6 are distinctly different than the giants in Numbers 13 because they're not mentioned as a descendant of a specific group, as Numbers 13 said. As we move toward the flood, final two questions. How did Noah fit two of all the animals on the ark? The best way to answer that question is he didn't. I know what some of you are thinking. What do you mean he didn't? Read the story this week. Noah didn't put the animals on. God brought them. I think somehow we get this idea that Noah said, all right, here I go. Let's go round them up. By the way, I kind of understand this because um, we have three little young ladies at our house. They're chickens. And when we try to round them up, it's a futile cause. I mean, it's absolutely, I feel like, you remember the movie Rocky? You remember where his trainer said, until you can catch the chicken, then you're ready. That's how I feel a lot of times, you know, chasing them around. Can't, can you imagine saying, come here, little Mr. Hippo. Come on, let's go. I mean, can you imagine telling a lion, I know you really want to go on the boat. The Bible says that the Lord brought the animals, two of every kind. Let me remind us that if you have two of the canine species, you don't have to have every breed of dog known to man. And so I think oftentimes we overanalyze. The last question for our time tonight, did it really flood the whole earth? Two years ago, this month, our former home received 20 inches of rain in 24 hours. And people's houses had water up to the second floor. According to the Bible, it rained nonstop for 40 days and 40 nights. Based on what I saw in South Louisiana two years ago, it is without question that if that had kept up for 40 days and 40 nights, even the mountains themselves would have been submerged. See, one of the criticisms of Scripture is they look at all that we've looked at and they look at that flood and they say, well, that's just a localized story to a local group of people to explain the issues they were dealing with. That's not what the Bible testifies The Bible doesn't say it was this group of people in this place for this reason. The Bible testifies that these are our ancestors and this is our story. The Bible also says that the Lord put a rainbow in the sky to say, I will never flood the earth again. But the Bible does say in 2 Peter chapter 3 that judgment will come to the earth in the future. This time not by water, but by fire. That's right, it's, it's only going to be a, a part of the earth, not all the earth. Please note my sarcasm. If we believe in 2 Peter 3 and Revelation chapter 20 that it is all the earth, then it stands fit to say that in Genesis chapter 6 through 9, it was all of the earth as well. We could come up with a dozen or more questions of the book of Genesis, and I'm sure tonight I didn't answer all of your questions. But allow me to say this thing, the struggle that we have with Scripture isn't what we read, it's believing what we read as it is written. In Jesus' time, there were a group of men, primarily, Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes, who did not want to believe that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. 
They did not want to fulfill that he was the Messiah, that he was God incarnate, because it didn't fit what they wanted it to look like. The struggle with Genesis isn't what it says, it's what we want it to look like and what we want it to say. In fact, in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, every aspect of everything we need to know is there. We have the doctrine of creation,